Good afternoon. It's Tuesday, the 4th of October 2016, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. I'm your host, Brian Gerrish, with me in the studio, Mike Robinson. And we will be joined by live video Skype link uh, by David Ellis from Strategic Defence Initiatives. Well, the good news is there's been a bit of sunshine in Holland, at least. Um, we've got a bit of sun, some grey skies across UK, uh, but uh, generally people seem happy. I'm sure we can do something about that, Mike. Absolutely, absolutely right. Well, we're going to start with Russia. Um, and, uh, well, the situation between Russia and America getting worse every minute. Uh, Russia really confused, perhaps, by the uh, uh, situation with John Kerry in particular, who on one hand has been quite conciliatory, uh, attempting the di diplomatic route. In the meantime, Ash Carter, on the other hand, uh, being quite the opposite. Uh, and uh, it looks like Kerry has gone the same way. So the Russians reacting to that, uh, what they're describing as completely irrational behavior. Uh, and uh, this, uh, the picture on the screen there is uh, the Deputy Foreign Minister, Sergei uh, Ryabkov. Uh, and uh, he said, we are now at the stage of a very sharp conceptual disagreement with those who, like the US, uh, rep uh, representative to the United Nations, are trying to moralize without having the slightest justification for that. He said, this is a big trauma and a fundamental problem for the American establishment as a whole. Uh, talking about the fact that uh, um, the G20 rejected uh, the US position on Syria, for example, uh, they cannot overcome themselves. And, they're and also, fortunately, they're not able to subvert the whole world. This is such a dif difficult emotional background, which we have to deal with. Uh, and he says, uh, uh, I've, I have to state that the last few weeks have proven to be very disturbing and very revelatory in terms of demonstrating what has been long hidden behind politically correct or almost political, polit politically correct rhetoric of our US colleagues. The top of Washington's hierarchy has probably made a political decision to use this situation in order to achieve the goal that, is, that it has always set itself, namely to reformat the Syrian political geometry. If so, then we completely part ways with the Americans. So uh, these words, absolutely clear. I think they're very interesting words, Mike, and um, on numerous occasions we've been lost for words on this news programme because we simply don't know how to describe the utterly bizarre behaviour, let's just say by the British government, whether it's David Cameron or Michael Fallon or Theresa May, and now we see the Russians uh, prepared to declare on a, on a world stage in front of the media that they regard the behaviour of um, serious uh, political leaders in, in the United States, and that will include UK, as, as being bizarre. So um, something serious is going on that we've got politicians who are no longer behaving in a rational way. That must be immensely dangerous to the Russians, um, obviously, who are, watch, who, who, who are watching who has their finger on the button. Well, we'll so come to speak. on to their reaction to this in a second. But David, what are your thoughts? Well, the the game's up, isn't it? You know, UKC and uh, uh, and us here at Strategic Defence Initiatives have warned now for some time that they're gearing for war. Uh, they're going to use Syria as the catalyzing event in order to give birth to the new EU military constructs. They have to talk the war up. They're obviously engaged out there in some pretty dirty deals. Uh, the Russians have have clearly seen the game they've given up talking to them you know paul craig roberts in america has, has, has actually said this openly you know what, what more can russia do you know america now the main agents for this is is it's just blatant you know the stuff is blatant people are seeing through it it was apparent yesterday to me at, at tory party conference that people are seeing through this and it's the contradictory policy which is their undoing because they're just being so um insanely uh, uh, in the way they're going about with making statements and making policy that's completely contradictory so you know I think that we're gearing for a little we're, we're gearing for a war um, and I've warned a couple of weeks ago that the chances of them opening up another front out in Afghanistan and, and Pakistan are very high now and well it's funny you should say that David because in yesterday's program we were pointing out uh, a whole tranche of uh, aid money going into Afghanistan uh, and uh, of course where the aid money goes uh, you know military soon follow yeah 
it, it, it'll follow on. It's hand in glove. Um, you know, what, look, at, look at the big, the, the big key factors at the moment. We're continually being told now for quite some time we've had a banking crisis. We haven't. Nonsense. What we've had is a banking boom. What we've got is a democratic crisis. That's what we've got. You know, this is how inverted it is. We see these messages that are being pumped out. And there's a load at the Tory party conference, completely inverted messages all the while. You know, but it's, it's down to the public to look at them properly and, uh, and interpret them and translate them to actually what they are. So I'm just going to reiterate that. It's not, a bank, it's not a banking crisis. It's a democratic crisis because the MPs are not doing their job because they're com they are utterly constrained within their party, the, the party system. So the party system has failed the people. It doesn't represent the people. Okay, well, let, look, let's, uh, let's look at uh, Russia's reaction further then, because uh, Vladimir Putin here, this is TASS, the Russian news agency, uh, has uh, announced that he wants to suspend uh, the year 2000 treaty uh, on, uh, on plutonium. Uh, and this is going to the Duma uh, for uh, a vote on October the 14th. Uh, it says, uh, the, the decree says, uh, in connection with the fundamental change of the circumstances and the emergence of a threat to strategic stability as a result of unfriendly actions by the United States towards Russia and the United States inability to ensure compliance with the assumed commitments to utilizing excessive weapons grade plutonium under international treaties and also pr proceeding from the need for urgent measures to protect the security of Russia. Uh, and uh, so, you know, this is, this is further evidence that the Russians have decided that uh, they can't work with the Americans. Uh, and then Sputnik here uh, reporting today that uh, the Russians uh, are also likely to vote on the ratification of the existence of a, uh, an airbase in Syria. Uh, and this is saying the Russian parliament has indicated that it may ratify a new agreement for the deployment of a Russian air group uh, air, to uh, Heminem uh, Air Base by the end of the week. The state Duma may react with uh, ratifying the Syrian air group agreement, a source told RIA Novosti, uh, and that would be the best response. So that's going on. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, the Russians uh, holding this large-scale civil defense drill to take place between the 4th and the 7th of October. Uh, Brian and David, this is an incredible drill. Uh, Emercom here reporting 40 million Russians taking part in this. Uh, they're saying three stages, the organization of civil defense actions, planning and organization of civil defense actions, uh, organization of actions, actions of civil defense management bodies and forces for response to large disasters and fires. 40 million people, as I say, 200,000 specialists of emergency rescue divisions and about 500, uh, sorry, about 50,000 units of equipment to be deployed in the drill. They're going to rehearse uh, radiation, chemical and biological protection of personnel and population during emergencies at critical and potentially dangerous facilities, fire safety, civil defence and human protection at social institutions and public buildings. Uh, and response units will deploy radiation, chemical and biological monitoring centres and sanitation points at the emergency areas, while laboratory control networks are going to be put on standby. Um, I was saying earlier to Brian, David, this... The British government could not organise something like this, but, but the response here, and it's certainly what seems to be the speed of the response, is something we should be taking note of. There's been a considerable escalation. Russia, Russia has clearly realised that, it, that the, the, the Americans and the EU uh, and our facade of a government are clearly going to, despite how repugnant we think it is and we think it won't happen and it's not a good idea, Believe you me, it's going to happen. They're not daft. They can see it coming. And I think that there'll be an escalation of defence stances very, very quickly. Very quickly. You know, we're, we're, in effect, we're, we're in effect sliding from DEFCON 3 to DEFCON 2, more or less as we speak. So, you know, the fact that they were... They're now, I think the Russians are actually aware that the pr nuclear proliferation has occurred out in the oil-producing countries. And this is what's precipitated all of this agitation with then uh, pushing NATO troops uh, for the time being. There'll soon be EU troops up to the, up to the Russian borders uh, and, and the stationing of, of short range tactical nuclear weapons up towards their, their borders because the, the, they'll, they just won't have the time for this. But make no bones about it. This is only going one direction now. 
Um, yeah, David, very good point. I just want to add to this. I think many people in UK just um, have not been able to appreciate the um, aggression. As far as the, the Russians are concerned, they're quite right. The aggression of all the movement we've seen of British, American and NATO troops, which have been pushed right up onto the Russian borders. This has been passed off as more or less uh, games and uh, a few troops here and there. But of course, from a Russian point of view, those troops right on the Russian borders immensely um, dangerous. Uh, then we've had the breach of previous agreements by the Americans. That's gone on step by step by step. And the, Amer uh, the Russians have taken all of this. And then I think probably the, the thing which has really made the difference is that American attack on, on Syrian government forces, because this basically said that the, the US was now prepared to do anything to get its for, uh, aggressive foreign policy running, even the risk of killing Russian troops, because that air raid must have come very, very close to actually involving um, uh, Russian advisors on the ground. So now we're seeing, we're seeing Russia say, well, OK, we're going to take it seriously. And I think the other thing to remember is that America uh, feels that it has a lot of combat experience, but actually America's combat experience um, post-Korean uh, War, at least, is against relatively minor states where um, air power and, of course, American technology is, has generally come out extre extremely well. The Russians, totally different kettle of fish. And, and the Russians, of course, remember only too well uh, that the uh, German invasion of the Second World War, massive casualties. Nobody knows how many on the Russian side, 30, 38 million. They know how to conduct full scale ground operations. And I think this is this is an indication that they are protecting themselves by running these exercises. But at the same time. They're saying to the Americans, well, if, if you're going to play this game, then we are going to do the job properly. I, I, I think these, these events, uh, which have been created by lying, dishonest Western politicians, David Cameron, Blair Brown, uh, William Hague, they're all in this picture somewhere. And now wh where, where are we getting to very, very serious events um, around uh, Eastern Europe? David. We we said um, I think on the last time we was the last time I was on that we're back to the Cuban Missile Crisis. We're at that level of intensity, and believe you me, we really are. And this is being openly said on on numerous different sort of uh, news channels now. It's coming back through sort of different sort of people that have realised that you know this chatter of. Uh, this level of intensity that we're getting, people are sort of using that as the kind of benchmark to this now. That this is the degree of this is the degree of trouble that we're really in. You know, this is really, really serious. And the and and you know, or I, I look back now on kind of crikey with the conversations I was having with the lead American military attaché in Moscow before Sochi, before the before the games, and all this was more or less sort of being discussed. You know, this is a roller coaster now. And the big, well, not a roller coaster. This is almost like a runaway train. Sorry, it's a runaway train because Britain now couldn't fight its way out of a wet paper bag. We are intertwined with this, uh, you know, infernal EU military structure, you know, and we're going to get carried into this. We're going to get carried into this with Russia, and we've got no business in there whatsoever doing this. It is so wrong. Uh, indeed. OK, well, look, um, let's uh, look at the South China Sea then, because, of course, uh, and the Southeast Asia, because, of course, that's uh, that's an important area as well. And we begin with the US Philippine uh, drills, which are starting uh, and uh, the Washington Post here asking us if if they will be the last. Uh, they're saying US and Philippine forces open joint combat exercises under some uncertainty on Tuesday, days after the Philippines new leader said they would be the last such drills of his six year uh, presidency. Uh, Marine can uh, commanders from both sides said the opening ceremony that the exercises, including 1,100 American and 400 Filipino military personnel, are aimed at improving readiness by the two countries uh, to respond to a range of crises while deepening their historic ties. Well, I mean, this rhetoric from the United States side uh, doesn't reflect reality, and because, of course, we're talking about uh, Rodrigo Duterte, and uh, he has been uh, pretty outspoken, as we very well know, about. Uh, Obama in particular, 
Uh, and uh, he has said uh, recently, in the last day or two, that he will be asking the United States to leave the Philippines altogether. Uh, Tomorrow I will be friends with Putin and Xi Jinping, he said. Uh, and he said uh, that uh, he is going to use an upcoming visit to China later in the month to make friends with them and also Russia. Uh, he said uh, that the Americans, I don't like them. They're rep reprimanding me in public. So I say, screw you, F you, everything else, you are stupid. Um, so he's quite clear in how he feels about the Americans. Uh, and uh, it's, it's clear that uh, at least that particular Philippine government intending to reorient its, uh, its, its geopolitical place in the world. Which is an amazing event apart from anything else due to American bases in the region. Um, so there, there, so it remains to be seen whether how long the Americans can stay there. Um, and in the meantime, Indonesia, now they uh, are not friends of the Chinese, um, and they are holding their uh, largest military exercise, their air forces, in the South China Sea uh, today. Uh, and, uh, well, they're saying that basically we want to show our existence in the area. We've a good enough air force to act as a deterrent, is what they're saying. We're going to deploy 2,000 air force personnel two week long exercise. Uh, they've got a fleet of Russian Sukhoi and F-6 and also American F-16 jets. Uh, and uh, uh, they don't, they aren't really uh, fighting with or disputing claims in the South China Sea with China. Uh, they don't like the fact that uh, China's demarcation line uh, comes a bit too close to the uh, Natuna Islands, um, but uh, they're not overtly uh, shouting about it. Nonetheless, they feel the need to, to sort of express themselves in this way. So what we seem to be seeing uh, is, is a, a, a big upscaling in the militarization right around, right around the, the Russian-Chinese um, flanks. So, uh, and an increase in tension, aggression yes. and tension and uncertainty. And where's this been created from? Well, it must have been created from a joint US uh, UK standpoint, because nobody else has been uh, involved in, in the conflict. Right. David? Yeah, one, one thing there with the guy in the Philippines, uh, uh, Prime Minister Gough Whitlam in uh, the 70s, I believe, in Australia, wanted rid of the secret US uh, Air Force base in the middle of uh, the desert out there, and the Queen dismissed him. He was a duly elected Prime Minister, and he was summarily dismissed by the Governor. So. This is, this is, I mean, all credit to that guy out there for standing up for his people and all the rest of it, but he's seriously got his work cut out and all those people have got to, you know, if they're serious about their cause, they've got to stand together. Indeed. Okay, and then just finally on this little section, uh, Yemen, uh, we've got Tobias Elwood here, uh, very concerned by the continued steps being taken by the Houthi and Saleh Alliance. Uh, basically, he's complaining that uh, the, uh, the, well, we can't really call them rebels because they're not really rebels, but the, the Houthis, as they're described, have set up a national salvation government. And of course, this is in rivalry to the Western-backed uh, government in waiting, uh, which is backed by uh, the United States, the UK, uh, obviously Saudi Arabia. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so Tobias Elwood, very concerned about that. Uh, he said, uh, the Yemeni parties must consult and work with the United Nations Special Envoys special envoy in order to come to an agreement and return stability to the country. Uh, well, we've said this before, we'll just say it again. The first step must be for the Saudis to stop bombing the country and then perhaps proper peace talks can take place. Well, that's, that's true, Mike. Interesting to see always this bull, excuse me, bullying attitude. You've got to do what the UN says and, and then you look at how the UN works. Well, if it doesn't tow the, uh, particularly the US-UK line, then uh, we... we Derogate from that. We'll come on to that in a minute. Oh, okay. So you're there. Yes. Well, let's uh, move through to um, the state of Britain's military. And uh, Michael Fallon been uh, speaking out. He says that he wants more recruits from ethnic minorities and more women. I've opened up all combat roles to women, so ability, not gender, defines how, defines how far you can go. This isn't about tokenism. It's about talent. What a bizarre situation, David. I'm going to let you respond to this. But as you said, at the moment, we've got British military, which in sense of a significant um, field of com combat, you've used the expression, couldn't fight their way out of a wet paper bag. 
that's going to upset a few people. But what you're really doing is stating the disastrous state of the military as a result of David Cameron's strategic defense initiative. And Fallon is now making that situation worse because we've got a remarkably small army bring in more women and ultimately that that the capability on the combat side is going to go down i know this is going to be a prickly subject for some ladies out there but this is the harsh reality i could imagine a wry smile from the russians as they um, they think about combat against a british army with maybe 50 percent mothers what do you think And with that, we may have lost him, I think. Yes. OK, all right. Well, we'll follow through with uh, the second part of Mr. Uh, Fallon here, if we can bring him up. Uh, he's also uh, commenting on the, uh, uh, the fact that uh, the government's now decided they're going to try and protect uh, troops from uh, uh, legal cases where they've been accused of wrongdoing. He says, I announced today that in future conflicts, we intend to derogate from the EU convention. Uh, that will protect our armed forces from many of the industrial sc uh, scale claims we have seen post Iraq and Afghanistan. So there's mixed comment on this, which we're going to do a little bit of analysis on. Um, but uh, I'm just fascinated with this word derogate, Mike, because what they're basically saying is they're going to withdraw from uh, the EU human rights aspect. Uh, but they don't seem to want to say so bluntly. We use a word we don't often see, derogate. Yes. It's, uh, what, designed to a um, little bit of a smokescreen over the top, I think. Some special language in use there. Indeed. Uh, well, let's remind ourselves of um, local Conservative MP Johnny Mercer, former soldier. He said he couldn't envisage a more scrutinised battlefield. We've asked our soldiers to operate than... Afghanistan. So he was basically sticking up for the uh, uh, military. And of course, the criminal investigations a few years ago were being heavily pushed by the British government, which made the whole system to bring in uh, civilian lawyers to get involved in court martials for um, criminal behaviour on the battlefield. It was the government that brought this in. Now, all of a sudden, the whole thing has been swung so that the government is saying, well, we're going to protect our troops. I think there's something much deeper going on, and uh, I'm going to put this forward today, and we'll see, see what people think. So let's bring in Liberty, uh, because, of course, uh, Liberty has been chosen. This is from The Guardian, um, and the quote from Martha Spurrier, the director of Liberty, is the truth is that derogation will protect no one except those at the MOD with something to hide. It will make us hypocrites on the international stage and embolden our enemies uh, to capitalise on our double standards. And she goes on to say, if ministers held our troops in the high, high regard they claim, they would not do them the disrespect of implying they can't abide by human rights standards. For a supposedly civilised nation, that is a pernicious and retrograde step. Now, many people might agree with that, but I'm going to say we've decided to stay on the case of who is liberty, and we could also be asking who is Martha Spurrier. So we just remind ourselves of uh, what we produced yesterday, which uh, uh, we'd picked up on Sarah Ogilvie. She'd been speaking out publicly, and we just identified that uh, on her side, through liberty, she was connected in with a low commission, which led us through to change agents uh, such as Barrow Cadbury Trust, Esme Fairburn, uh, but also through to banks. So we've got a link through to uh, Lankelly Chase, which was formerly set up by Bearings Bank. Uh, that went bust, so in came Netherlands ING. But of course, these are all people who say they're there to watch out for our liberty and to make sure justice is being done. So let's have a look at the latest lady. Here she is, Martha Spurrier. And uh, she's obviously linked in with all that uh, we've just shown for Liberty. Uh, but we can also say she was previously involved with the public law project, uh, supposedly um, giving us the means to challenge uh, legal decisions which have been pushed forward by public bodies. Uh, she's been involved with MIND. This young lady's only 30. Um, so a barrister, but um, uh, 
she's extremely experienced, Mike, as you can see. Doughty Street Chambers, uh, who boast they are there for human rights issues. And then we discover that she's also part of the Civil Liberties Trust. And that's an interesting organization because that pushes in the money to enable Liberty to jump on whatever bandwagon it wants. And if we have a little look behind the scenes, uh, surprise, surprise, we're back into the change agents such as Joseph Roundtree. They're busy donating money. And we find a nice little link through this lady, um, Andrew Arthur, who just happens to be at the heart of Common Purpose. Uh, so really, we want to say, um, who are these people and what is their agenda in jumping onto this uh, bandwagon around British troops? I think we might have David back. Were you able to follow that, David? Yeah. I'm not sure when you came back online. I lost you when you were when you were talking about Fallon and the contradictory policy and and talking about our sort of status. So I, 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 I better just close something there. You know, my, my my comments there about Britain not being able to fight its way out of a wet paper bag are in no way directed at any service personnel. The criticism that I am making is that of the the management in the MOD and the political. Uh, the political people that are involved in making these insane decisions. So please differentiate on that one. So, you know, this continued avenue that we're going down here, you know, we're not looking at anything like or addressing our actual cardinal values problems. You know, we should be looking at unraveling ourselves from the EU, plugging the gaps, addressing our cardinal value shortfall. And he's, we're obviously struggling a bit with that. Uh, well, I'll just reiterate the point that David's made there. In, uh, we're being highly critical at the moment about government policy over defence and where it's left our services. As David Ellis has just said, we are not pointing a finger at the men and women serving on the ground. Right. Um, last night uh, on, on Humanity versus Insanity, uh, Ian Crane was speaking to Philip King uh, about uh, surveillance and so on. Um, I'm just going to cover a couple of subjects on this. The first one is this one. Um, the uh, British government is uh, the Department of International Trade uh, and the UK Defence and Security Organisation um, are looking for businesses, apparently, with expertise in fields. <clears throat> They're going to take them to uh, India uh, to promote uh, smart city, smart cities agenda, the connected cities agenda. They're looking for businesses that are interested in waste management. The circular economy, Brian. You know what the circular economy is? I think I might be able to guess, Mike. But... Well, apparently it's a generic term for an industrial economy that produces no waste and no pollution by design or intention. Uh, and uh, material flows of two types, biological nutrients uh, designed to re-enter the biosphere safely, technical nutrients which are designed to circulate at high quality in the production, so recycling in other words. Uh, but, uh, for example, it, com it, it uh, describes waste as being food. So waste does not exist, according to circular economy. The biological and technical components are a product of designed, uh, sorry, of a product are designed by intention to fit within a material cycle, designed for disassembly and repurposing. The biological nutri nutrients are non-toxic and be simply composted and go back into the uh, food system. So it's a circular economy, apparently. Uh, and uh, but anyway, they intend to create uh, 100 smart cities. Uh, we've been covering the cities agenda for a long time. Smart cities in particular is, isn't an area that we've uh, covered in detail yet, um, but uh, it is an area we're particularly interested in because of the surveillance implications of it, obviously. Um, but I just wanted to uh, uh, highlight this as a secondary story um, because uh, it's been obvious to us that um, selfies and the craze for selfies has been all about facial recognition. Uh, from the beginning, that's what it was about, as far as I was concerned. Uh, and uh, well, here we see it: selfie pay. This is being launched by Mastercard, uh, and it is allowing online shoppers to use fingerprints or selfies to verify their identities. So we're looking at biometrics uh, right in the heart of the banking system. Uh, move towards a cashless society. Uh, they're saying the identity check mobile application. Uh, allows customers to complete purchases without the need to enter a password or a PIN. So that's got to be good. It has. And perhaps I should just add that uh, I did uh, need to get a little computer repair done 
recently. Um, I dropped off my machine. It was duly repaired, but there was some talk when I went to pick it up that I might have to produce um, photo ID in order to collect my own uh, computer, which I'd deposited into the repair shop. So maybe that's where we are going to be. You need your passport if you need to go and get your computer repaired. Indeed. Well, uh, if you um, missed last night's Humanity versus Insanity, what to watch? If you're watching this on the uh, UK column live stream uh, on the website, uh, it will follow this program. So you can watch it again. See it. Okay. Well, a reminder that uh, the 19th of November is the British Constitution Group event in Winchester. Uh, what are we saying? We're saying that uh, law has completely broken down now in the UK. Uh, we know from events going on around us, uh, people being beaten up in police stations, children being taken away with absolutely no grounds by the state, overseas wars, unlawful overseas wars, as we're going to come on to the subject of torture. Uh, we are now living effectively in a lawless country. What do we do about it? How do we, how do we uh, get out of this uh, particular predicament? Uh, these are all key parts of the British Constitution Group event. So if you can get there, please come and join us. And if you buy your tickets in advance, £10, £20 on the door. Now, we are getting an increasing number of people who say to us, we can see things going on. Uh, we're getting quite nervous about what's happening. And um, we want to know what to do about it. And a little expression that was given to us some years ago was that action conquers fear. And this is really a key part of it, that once you know something is wrong, uh, the thing to do is to be starting to meet up with other people and talk about it because uh, the uh, physical partnership just uh, you know boosts things and uh, makes things better. So uh, British Constitution Group in particular encouraging people to get involved in networks to spread information and evidence as to what's going on and solutions. And uh, Theo has said that uh, we're particularly interested in uh, picking up people uh, who want to get involved from the Milton Keynes, Lincoln, Totnes and Southampton areas. So if you've concerns about what's happening in UK and you're thinking, what can I do about it? Uh, get in touch with the British Constitution Group uh, because uh, there are many good ideas. Interesting, Mike, we're, we're, we're getting constant uh, comments now that uh, people are talking about waking up and seeing that something's wrong in the country. Um, and the rule of law is uh, right at the heart of that. People are using the, uh, the phrase quite a lot and indeed on the other side of this discussion as well because here we've got Liz, Liz Truss, uh, the Right Honourable Elizabeth Truss MP, uh, Lord Chancellor and Secretary of State for Justice and she was speaking in Westminster Hall yesterday on the opening of the legal year uh, and uh, so this was her first uh, breakfast as Lord Chancellor uh, and she said, uh, she was talking about common law Brian, she said uh, we can see the results of our history uh, our common law system, founded on that precious asset, the rule of law, has been emulated for centuries by countless jurisdictions. An immensely civilizing influence on the world, it has spread liberty, order, and prosperity to billions. Uh, we know, and the world knows, that our law and our justice system is among the best. Our judges, many of whom are here today, are rightly celebrated for being independent, impartial, and utterly incorruptible. Well, we may uh, have a discussion about that. Uh, but anyway, she went on to say, I'm delighted to be working with the next, with a great generation of reforming senior judges, including the Lord Chief Justice, uh, Lord John Thomas, uh, with whom I recently published a joint plan for the modernizing of the courts and tribunals. And I mean, that plan in itself uh, really uh, makes a mockery of the suggestion that uh, judges are incorruptible. Anyway, we go on. She then went on to say, our lawyers who, rep who uh, also represented by many among you, uh, have a global reputation for excellence that is second to none. It is for those reasons that business leaders from London to Asia prefer our law to be the governing law of their commercial contracts. Uh, and it is why our capital is renowned as the leading global center for international legal services and dispute resolution. Well, that's encouraging, Mike. I don't know that common law has any uh, anything to do with resolving these legal disputes as she's talking about. But anyway, she went on to say, if we yes, uh, and as we continue to build our unique and uh, precious legal tradition, I am determined as Lord Chancellor to respect the rule of law 
near and abroad, to defend the independence of the judiciary and to ensure the provision of resources for the support of the courts. These crucial elements and the commitment of so many here today will ensure that our justice system continues to lead the world. So she has made it clear that she intends to respect the rule of law here and abroad. And I think uh, that's very good of her to say that. Tell us that we can now um, hold her to account. Uh, uh, well, we can, but I, w I would assume that probably this is um, just simply not true, Mike, because we haven't yet seen one of these politicians that's talking the truth about what's going on. So let's follow, follow that up uh, uh, with um, a reminder. Now, we brought this up the other day, but we're just going to go into it in a little bit more detail. Of course, British government has been pointing a finger at everybody else uh, uh, in order to say these are the bad people. So Gaddafi, of course, he's involved in torture. Uh, we've got that nasty Mr. Assad. He's busy gassing people. Um, Iraq, we've got uh, Saddam, who's... Uh, uh, of course, was accused of torture. So everybody else is up to it. Um, not the British government. We don't actually want to say what's going on, but it's all those other nasty people that are the uh, dictators. We get the occasional article creeping into the press, the independence here, complicity in torture, the case against the United Kingdom. Well, it's not really against the United Kingdom. It's against the individuals in government. Uh, what's, what are those individuals saying? Well, it's all the other nasty people that are doing it. It's not the nice people who form the British government. So, um, well, Blair looking a little bit uncomfortable when Chilcot uh, seemed to be coming his way, but that's all been swept under the carpet nicely, so no unlawful wars there. Uh, Telegraph uh, picking up on the fact that uh, people knew about torturing Guantanamo Bay. And it said in 2014, the U.S. Senate Intelligence Committee found CIA officers had conducted a brutal regime on captives of repeated waterboarding, slapping, stress positions and sleep deprivation. Admiral Lord West, formerly the security minister, said, well, there may have been there may have been the odd case where U.K. agents were present when U.S. agents were water. There may have been the odd case, Mike, nothing to worry about, really. An MI5 officer is likely to confirm top-level meetings were held at Thames House in 2002 to discuss torture claims. Uh, but of course, all the meetings that went on were done um, in private and were never made public. Now, I'd like to encourage people to get hold of a copy of this book, Cruel Britannia, A Secret History of Torture. It's actually by a man who's Guardian journalist, Ian Cobain. And in a very detailed book, he sets out the fact that uh, Britain uh, was heavily involved in torture as early as June 1940. MI5 secret interrogation centre being set up for its first customers on Britons who'd fallen under suspicion, but they then moved on to German prisoners of war. And he said that in torture centres across the world, the British government used military and civilian intelligence interrogation specialists to torture German prisoners of war, German military and civilian prisoners post-war, Palestinians, Kenyans caught up in the Mau Mau uprising, Arabs in Aden and other victims worldwide. And that continued, of course, with the 9-11 and ISIS terror suspects, victims including men, women and children and uh, what sort of things were going on, beatings, exhaustion, freezing, torture with mechanical devices, sexual torture, drugs, waterboarding, isolation. Uh, sorry, I got drugs in there twice, but we get, we get the picture. So this is a detailed book where the man actually went and spoke to victims of torture and looked at uh, declassified government documents, clearly showing that the British government was condoning and involved in torture. Have a look at here at the comment um, uh, by David Blair, a Telegraph journalist who did an uh, analysis of the book. And he said, oh, this is a terrible book. It's been flawed by admissions. He didn't bother to go into the factual evidence produced. Uh, he relied on the fact that uh, basically in a couple of places, uh, David Blair, uh, the author of the book on torture, uh, sorry, sorry, um, David Blair said that uh, in the book, uh, decisions were made by judges which uh, disproved 
um, what, what the book um, A Secret History of Torture was saying. So if we have a look at other material in the press here, we've, we've got this one from The Guardian, and this is a comment on um, admissions of torture and information coming out. It says here, finally, it has been well documented that there were secret detention facilities in the UK area of operations in Iraq, which appear to have bypassed prisoners of war facilities. If this is correct, it's in violation of the Geneva Conventions. And if the prisoners were spirited out of the country, that could amount to a grave breach. Um, soldiers were ordered to take part in the, uh, so the fault lies with their political masters. Trooper Ben Griffin is currently under an injunction from the High Court obtained by the MOD for threatening to speak out about prisoner abuse in Iraq and Afghanistan. So here we've got the classic that the British government simply threatens people who want to speak out. Uh, information goes through secret courts. And yet David Blair, the Telegraph journalist, says, oh, well, if, if judges in a secret court have decided nothing untoward went on, then there's no problem. So we thought we'd just have a little look at uh, David Blair himself. And uh, here he is. And uh, here's his uh, criticism. He said that uh, the author Cobain does not mention that key elements of Ahmed's testimony were explicitly rejected by uh, the Crown Court and three appeal court judges. So three judges say nothing happens, there's no problem. Judges appointed by the government, I think, Mike. Un uncorruptible. Uncorruptible. So uh, this was the ruling. Um, Rang Zeeb was not tortured by or on behalf of the British, nor with their encouragement, and he was not tortured at any time before the single occasion when he said he was seen by British officers. Indeed, whether or not he was tortured at all is not properly resolved. So there was no torture, but it's not properly resolved. And we're not going to resolve it because that might lead to the fact that he was tortured. Yes. So um, let's stay with our journalist from The Telegraph. Here's his Twitter page. Encourage people to go and have a look at it. And uh, what uh, were we very interested in? Uh, well, this chief speechwriter to the British Foreign Secretary, previously a Telegraph correspondent. So the man who undermines a very detailed book exposing the use of torture by the British government uh, is then promoted to become a speechwriter to uh, Boris Johnson. Got us just there, sir. Absolutely. So um, do get hold of a copy of the book. I found the information shocking. Uh, but uh, probably the biggest impact was, of course, to discover that the British government has been lying to you over so many years whilst pointing a finger at other people overseas. Right. So we will end uh, on, on a this, happy note. On a happy note, uh, because, uh, of course, if anybody thought that Pokemon Go was uh, the limit of uh, degrading uh, computer gamery, uh, then we've got uh, new limits. Uh, this is a zombie game, uh, zombie witch, apparently. Uh, so the France 24 here saying, uh, a high-pitched scream pierces the air as a zombie witch in a dirty white dress sprints down a street at a Sydney university, hair whipping around wild eyes as she chases a group of desperately scram uh, a group desperately scram scrambling to get out of her way. Welcome to Zed Town, uh, an adventure event where competitors play out a zombie ap apocalypse People race to reach an evacuation point to ensure their survival, but must also avoid being caught and turned by the undead. Described interchangeably as a giant game of zombie thing, uh, zombie themed tag and a live action video game, the events capitalize on an emerging legion of gamers who've grown up battling virtual enemies on computer screens and now want to experience such fantasies in real life. So are they fant fantasies or are they real? Is it a computer game or is it not? It just seems like it's messing with people's minds in a way that is uh, pretty unprecedented in the name of augmented reality. Uh, well, we know the uh, disastrous effects that horror movies can have on particularly young children or teenagers. And now you're putting that into virtual reality and you're playing it uh, dur during a you know, during your working day, if I describe it like that, this is extremely dangerous stuff. 
and obviously it's being unleashed on the public for uh, to achieve an effect, which but, is presumably disorientation and and to encourage mental illness. Do you think? Quite possibly, um, but uh, of course it's being presented as as a lot of fun and harmless fun at that. Uh, I think it's uh, there's deep psychology at work there, and I think it's pretty dangerous. Yeah, but I I don't think we'll see, be seeing the Home Secretary tackling that at all, uh, Mike. In her I think skin it, shoes. Uh, no, that's the Prime Minister, oh, of course. So they, yeah. OK, that brings us to the end of uh, today's news. Apologies uh, there. It's a shame that we lost uh, David Ellis. We'll, we'll see whether we can get him back uh, another time to, come on to comment on some of those military matters. Uh, but um, serious events unfolding, of course, uh, with Eastern Europe and the situation with Russia. Is the British government telling the truth? We don't think so. Um, are British politicians prepared to tell the truth? We don't think so. Dangerous times. And uh, we all need to be doing something uh, to reverse what's happening. Thank you for joining us. We'll be back same time tomorrow. Bye-bye.